If you look at the Times of the 23rd of July, 1976, on page 14, you'll find the following story. Two American mathematicians have just announced they have solved a proposition that has been puzzling their kind for more than 100 years. It is simply that four is the maximum number of colors needed on any map so that no two contiguous countries are colored the same. And it goes on to say, their proof published today runs to 100 pages of summary, 100 pages of detail, and a further 700 pages of backup work. It involved 1,000 hours of computer time, 10,000 diagrams, and the computer printout stands four feet high on the floor. And to think that in the 1880s, a headmaster set the problem as a challenge to his school, saying that no solution may exceed one page, 30 lines of manuscript, and one page of diagrams. So what is it about this problem which is so easy to state? Can all maps be coloured with just four colours? But took more than 100 years to solve. Well, let's go back to the beginning. The roots of the problem lie here in this college, University College London. An ex-student from here noticed that if you colour the counties of England like this, so that neighbouring counties have different colours, then you don't need more than four colours. And he wondered whether this is true for all maps. The student's name was Francis Guthrie. And he communicated the problem via his brother to Augustus de Morgan, professor of mathematics here at a university college. Well, de Morgan quickly became interested in the problem and mentioned it to several other mathematicians, including Sir William Rowan Hamilton, the Astronomer Royal of Ireland. And in fact, de Morgan's letter to Hamilton in October 1852 is almost certainly the earliest written reference to the problem. In this letter, de Morgan describes the problem, saying, it is tricky work, but the more I think of it, the more evident it seems. But although it seemed evident to de Morgan, he couldn't actually solve it. And I've often wondered what his reaction would be if he'd read the eventual report in the Times describing the complications of the proof. Well, that's enough of history for the time being. Let's look at the problem itself in a bit more detail. The problem asks whether any map whether it's the counties of England, the American states, the countries of the world, or any fictitious map which we may care to invent. Whether any map can be colored with just four colors so that no two neighboring countries have the same color. Notice that countries which meet just at a point are not considered to be neighboring countries. A is a neighbour of B and D, but it's not a neighbour of C. So it's allowable for A and C both to be coloured red. And similarly, it's allowable for both B and D to be coloured blue. The fact that you need at least four colours, and not, say, three or two, can be seen from a map like this one. It's impossible to colour it with fewer than four colours, and the remarkable thing about the four colour theorem is that it says that these four colours are sufficient to colour any map, however complicated. So that's the problem, and with de Morgan's help it soon became part of mathematical folklore. But it wasn't until 1878, seven years after de Morgan's death, that any progress was made in the solution. In June of that year, the mathematician Arthur Cayley raised the problem at a meeting of the London Mathematical Society, asking whether the problem had been solved. And it was that that really got interest in the problem going. And in the following year, 27 years after Guthrie had first raised the problem, that a proof actually appeared by Alfred Bray Kemp, a London barrister and keen amateur mathematician. At least it was generally acknowledged to be a proof, but in fact contained a fatal flaw, a flaw which wasn't noticed for some 10 or 11 years. But although Kemp's proof was wrong, it did contain several of the key ideas in the now accepted proof. We're going to look at these ideas in some detail. The, the way we do it will be different from Kemp's, but the main ideas are all his. And the first one we're going to look at is the method of, math of mathematical induction. And what that means is this. Suppose that here you have all the maps, all the different types of maps, those with one country, two countries, all those with three, four, and so on, all the way up. Well, all the maps at this end can certainly be colored with four colors. This one can, 
these can, all of these three countries can, and so on. The question is, how far can we get using just four colors? Let's suppose you've four colored all the maps up to here. And I'll indicate this with four colored pens. The question is, how can I extend the colorings of these maps to the colorings of the next lot? Well, if I can answer that question, I can then continue the idea and extend it to these ones and these ones and so on, all the way up. So that's the basic question. Knowing the colorings of these ones, how do I extend it to the colorings of these ones? And to answer that question, we've got to look in a bit more detail at the sort of maps that we're discussing. Well, the boundaries of any map meet at a number of points. We can always assume that at each of these points, at least three boundaries meet. There are often more than three, but never less. This is because in the four color problem, points like this, where only two boundaries meet, don't have to be considered. We just regard this as being one continuous boundary. Having disallowed such points, and using the result known as Euler's formula, it's not difficult to show that any map must contain somewhere within it at least one of the following types of country. A country with just two boundaries, we'll call that a digon. A country with three boundaries, that's a triangle. One with four boundaries, a square. Or one with five boundaries, a pentagon. The exact shapes don't matter. It's the number of boundaries which is important. So whatever else the map contains, you must be able to find at least one of these somewhere in the map. And we call such a set of countries an unavoidable set, because we can't avoid it. Every map must contain at least one of them. So if we look at this map, for example, it's got a couple of countries with three boundaries and one with five boundaries. Other maps will contain different combinations, but the important point is that every map contains at least one of them. Well, this idea of an un unavoidable set is central to the proof of the theorem. But the one you've just seen is not the only one that we could have chosen. For example, if you take the pentagon and replace it by two adjacent pentagons and a pentagon joined to a hexagon, then we get another unavoidable set. And by replacing these by other configurations of countries, we can get larger and larger unavoidable sets, containing more and more complicated configurations of countries. We'll look at these large unavoidable sets in a minute. But for the time being, let's return to our original one. And I want to take these four countries one at a time and show that any map containing any of them can be four colored. I'm going to do it using the method of induction. The first one we consider is the two boundary country, the digon. If we can find a digon within a map, the first thing we do is to shrink it down to zero. The map now has one fewer country than before, and by our induction argument, we can assume that this map can be colored with four colors. What happens when we reinstate the digon? Since it has only two neighbors, they can use up at most two of the four colors. So there's no problem in coloring the digon. We just color it with either of the two remaining colors. And so we've managed to four color the original map. What about the triangle? Well, that's similar. We locate a triangle and shrink it down to zero. Again, the map has one fewer country than before. And by our induction argument, we can assume that this map can be four colored. When we reinstate the triangle, we see that it has only three neighbors, and these use up at most three colors. So we always have a fourth color left to color the triangle. And so again, we've been able to four color the original map. So that deals with maps containing a digon or triangle. And we say that a digon or triangle are reducible, because if we shrink them to a point, if we reduce them, and we four color the remaining map, then we can extend that coloring 
to a four-colouring of a map containing the digon or triangle. What happens for a square? If the map doesn't contain a digon or triangle, then we try to find a square. If we find one, we shrink it to zero, just as we did before. The resulting map contains one fewer country than before, so we assume by induction that we can four-colour it. But when we replace the square, a difficulty arises. Because it has four neighbours, we may need four colours to colour them, and there's no spare colour to colour the square. But this is where Kemp applied an ingenious argument, known now as a Kemp chain argument. He reasoned that this situation need never arise, that is, you need only three colours to colour the neighbours. His argument went like this. Just pick any pair of countries which aren't neighbours, say the red and the green. The red country might be at the start of a whole lot of interconnected red and green countries. And similarly, the green at the bottom might be at the start of another set of red-green countries. Now, one of two situations can occur. In the first, the two red-green bits are completely separate from each other. We can swap the greens and reds in either bit without upsetting the colouring of the rest of the map. So just looking at the top bit, we swap the reds and greens there. So now there are only three colours used for the neighbouring countries, and the middle country can now be coloured with the fourth colour, red. And so we've four coloured the map. But that only works when the red-green bits are separate from each other. Suppose now that the red-green bits are not separate. Suppose that they link up. This gives rise to the second situation. Now, if we swap the red and green in the top bit, it swaps the red and green in the bottom bit too, and we're no better off than we were before. But now, because there's a solid red-green link, the blue-yellow bits must be separate from each other. So let's turn our attention to these. We can swap the blues and yellows in the right-hand bit, say, without upsetting the rest of the map. And again, we've only used three colours for the neighbours. And the fourth colour, blue, can now be used for the square. So we've again coloured the map with just four colours. Well, that case was more difficult, because we could have four different colours surrounding the square. And we, we might have to fiddle around with the colours so that we can extend the colouring to include the square. But as we've just seen, we can always do it. And we express this by saying that the square is reducible. We shrink it to a point, four-colour the remaining map, and then put the square back again. We can always extend the colouring to the case where the square is there. So that shows that we can four-colour any map containing a digon, triangle, or square. Where Kemp went wrong was to try and extend the same idea to the case where there's a pentagon as well. And in doing that, he had to look at the case where you did two Kemp interchanges of colour at the same time. Either of them is fine on its own, but if you try to do both at once, then it goes wrong. And the reason it goes wrong was pointed out by a mathematician from Durham called Percy Hayward. Hayward wrote a paper 11 years after Kemp's, pointing out the error, but he managed to salvage enough to prove the five-colour theorem that every map can be coloured with five colours. So let's see how Hayward showed that Kemp was wrong in trying to do two colour interchanges at once. This map is the counterexample Hayward produced. The country in the middle is a pentagon, and we want to use a Kemp chain argument to colour it, given the four colouring of the rest of the map. This is fine if you do it correctly, but we're going to follow Kemp's argument and show what can go wrong. Look at the blue and the yellow. They're connected by a blue-yellow chain. And this chain stops the reds and greens up here from mixing with the reds and greens down here. So we can swap the reds and greens in the top bit without upsetting those in the bottom bit, giving us this colouring. 
and that's perfectly all right. Or we could have done another interchange. Look at the blue and the green. They're connected by a blue-green chain. But this chain stops the reds and yellows here from mixing with the other reds and yellows. So we can swap the reds and yellows down here without upsetting the others. And that's perfectly all right too. So we've done two color interchanges. Either is all right on its own, but what happens if you try to do both at the same time? You get two reds coming together. So you can't do two Kemp interchanges at the same time. So where does all this leave us? The error in Kemp's proof is certainly a major one. And as the years went by, it became clearer and clearer that the, proof, that the problem is, in fact, very, very difficult. So it's very much to the credit of the two mathematicians who finally solved it. But before looking at it, what they actually did, let's review once more what, where we've got to so far. We started with this unavoidable set. Every map contains at least one of these. And we also saw that the first three of these configurations are reducible, in that any colouring of the rest of the map can be extended to include this configuration as well. But we weren't able to cope with this one, the pentagon. What we do is to replace it by other configurations to see if these are reducible. And if not, we try another unavoidable set, and so on. What we want eventually is an unavoidable set of reducible configurations. Unavoidable means that every map contains at least one of them, and reducible means that whichever one it is, then the proof can be completed. But how is such a set constructed? I put this question to the two mathematicians who finally solved the problem, Professor Kenneth Appel and Professor Wolfgang Harkin of the University of Illinois. Well, the first difficulty was that it wasn't clear that the conjecture was true. And if it was true, it wasn't clear that it could be solved by Kemp's technique. And if it could be solved by Kemp's technique, it wasn't certain that this could be done in a reasonable length of time. For instance, if the number of configurations was too large, or if the time it was required by computer to check one configuration was too large, the problem would be impossible. The difficulty in checking reducibility depended on the size of the configuration, where the size is measured by the number of countries neighboring the configuration uh, which were not in the configuration. If the size was eight, it would take quite a while by hand. If the size was 14, would take 4,000 times that long by hand. Uh, the second problem was the general problem of finding unavoidable sets of configurations which hadn't been studied sufficiently thoroughly at that time. So what approach did you take, Professor Harkin? Well, uh, we had a method of estimating how likely a configuration was to be reducible. Of course, that was not a sure thing, but it had about 80 to 90 percent accuracy. And so we started uh, to first find an unavoidable set of likely reducible configurations in order to see how large the set would be. And much later, we started uh, really having a computer uh, to check reducibility. So that was a fortunate strategy, which uh, saved much computer time. So what was the next thing you did? At a certain point, we decided we actually needed to be able to check configurations for reducibility. At that point, we invited John Koch, who was then a graduate student, to join us. And he began writing computer programs to check for reducibility. At the same time, we continued our study of unavoidable sets and improved our techniques to the point that the techniques we were using by hand were more appropriate than the computer techniques for checking unavoidability. And so we continued by hand looking for the unavoidable set while using the computer to check reducibility. Professor Harkin, 
So you made up an unavoidable set and then tested all the configurations for reducibility? Uh, it was not quite that way. Suppose we had acted like this and one of the configurations had turned out to be not reducible, then everything had been lost. So fortunately, we had a technique which allowed us to uh, construct only a few configurations at a time, then check them for reducibility, and the one or two which did not work, we could then replace by others and go on. So we were doing everything uh, simultaneously. We know that you had to use a computer to establish the reducibility of about 2,000 configurations. So that we can get a feeling for this, how long would it take to check the reducibility of just one configuration by hand? For one of the more difficult configurations, we would estimate that a man who was working a 40-hour week would take about five years to check the type of output a computer might give. It would be a pile of paper like this just for one configuration if we had the computer print everything. Now you imagine this 2,000 times. 2,000 times that high would be higher than the Empire State Building. When did you first come to realize you could actually prove the theorem? In the spring of 1976, we became more and more convinced that eventually we would be successful. In June of 1976, we were sufficiently convinced to write a note on our departmental blackboard, which read, Modulo careful checking, it appears that four colors suffice. In another month, we submitted our manuscript and the Department of Mathematics at the University of Illinois decided to use part of our note for their institutional advertising on a postage meter.